As if country life in medieval Japan wasn't hard enough, commoners also had to deal with greedy samurai and landlords. Do you ever feel like you're doing too much at work and getting paid too little, and there's nothing you can do about it because since you're just one insignificant worker, your pimp never listens to you? Japanese commoners had a similar problem. It's hard not to fight back when your bosses are threatening your future by taking your crops and raising taxes. But the problem with fighting back against your oppressors is that it tends to get you dead, and death will ruin your future. Luckily, people had a better option. The struggle between the common people and assholes could get intense. Mountains of complaint letters sent by villagers let us sneak a peek down the pants of this struggle and inside its underwear. One petition in 1275 in the Kamakura period talks about the deeds of one busy samurai. The document was written in the poor handwriting of commoners. The hard hands of workers were inferior to those of nobles who studied calligraphy for years to develop their soft hands. The petition describes one fine specimen of a samurai, just an overall great guy. The samurai discovered that the villagers had hidden a few farming fields from him, just didn't tell him about it. He got mad and forced them to pay taxes on those fields to him, even though taxes were legally supposed to go to the landlord of the region. He also made them pay a fine every year as punishment. It was unfair how the workers gave him no choice but to do that. One day, Mr. Samurai decided he needed a bunch of hemp and cotton and sent men to snatch them from some farmer's house. He forced people to cut trees for him and care for his horses, pretty much treated people like his servants. When some villagers said screw this and fled to find a better place where samurai were dicks of a smaller size, he hunted them down and forced them to plant barley in their abandoned fields. No, not barley. He said that if they refused, he would take their daughters and cut their ears, slice off their noses, shave their heads, tie them up, and march them around town. It was such an awful threat, people could barely believe it. It wasn't just samurai, even landowners dabbled in the occasional bullying. Landowners were either nobles or temples and shrines. They would sometimes tear down people's homes for materials or force people to do random manual labor. Sometimes people did pick up pitchforks and attack their overlords, but for villagers who enjoyed living, they tried working out their differences with the landowner. Life for most communities was a tug of war between the commoners and the landowner. Commoners wanted freedom, landowners wanted tax money. People negotiated, okay, I'll pay more in taxes, but I'm not taking care of your horse. Or, all right, I'll take care of your horse, but you have to fire Joe, the lonely official who's always creeping around our oxen. It was a delicate balancing act, above a field of unfairness. Defy too much and you get punished, but be too compliant and the landlord will step all over your ass without lube. You had to look out for yourself. Sharing is caring and no one cared. If working together with the elites failed, people turned to protests. Now if you're a protester and you start doing sit-ins at the drunken oppressor, they'd immediately kick you out and then kick your head out, civilly disobey that. No, that wasn't an option. But commoners did have one tool in their arsenal, their labor. And labor is a fine weapon. Early medieval protests had three steps, oath, petition, and run the fuck away. So if you're a villager and you think your lord is taxing your community to starvation, first you have to gather a bunch of people who want to do something about it. This may be hard because it's a dangerous road to go down, but if things are really that bad, people will go along. Your group of conspirators may number in the handful or in the hundreds, depending on how bad the problem is. Next step is to gather everyone to write a petition, a list of complaints and demands, along with an oath to the gods that everything written is true. This oath usually names a long list of Buddhist and Shinto gods, so prepare to be visited by an orgy of gods if you break the oath. People also included gods that the landowner worshipped, welcoming his own gods to verify the truthfulness of their words. Everyone signed the document. Members often signed their names in a circle, symbolizing equality. You couldn't call anyone a leader because there was no name that came first. Pretty cool because it meant a rich upper-class villager was equal to some puny little farmer, at least on paper, like they were united against a common enemy. In practice, there were probably leaders, like with any organized campaign. This first meeting was a whole big ceremony. It was like going to class on the first day and expecting a chill lecture, but then the professor drops a group activity on you. 
People performed a ritual to bind themselves to the cause. One popular ritual was to speak the oath, burn the document on which the oath was written, mix the ashes with water or some other sacred liquid, and have the members drink it. They might have rung some bells, too. The ceremony often took place at a temple or a shrine. This ritual sealed the pact. Anyone who broke the pact was shamed and punished, and no longer welcomed at samurai movie nights. After the ceremony, your protesters are formed, and you're ready to have someone bring a copy of the petition to the landowner. When a landlord saw a letter that started with an oath to a million gods and ended with 69 signatures, he knew it was going to be a root canal of a day. The villagers would await the landlord's response with tight sphincters. Would he give in to their demands, or would he send men with swords? Arrest, torture, and death could be on the horizon. Reality doesn't give out participation trophies. Sometimes the landowner and villagers sent letters back and forth, negotiating. To light a little fire under the lord's ass, the protesters would do something called melting into the mountains and forests. They ran away abandoning their homes and fields, and vowed not to return until their demands were met. It was a lot like negotiations between a union and a company. No villagers meant no tax money, and no tax money meant no gifts to seduce the wives of other nobles with. Now landowners were probably chomping at the tits to crush the peasant rebels. But these weren't some naive, oh hey, let's run away and see what happens type of deal. These were organized campaigns. If the landowner tried to bring in new farmers, the villagers would threaten the scabs with violence and mean words about how the gods would punish them. They held general assemblies of villagers to decide what to do next. It took leadership and coordination to convince people not to return home as their food was dwindling and their futures uncertain. These things could last for months, with the villagers sending petition after petition. The landowner might lose some income, but commoners stood to lose everything, the lives they had built on the land. After all that, if your group of dissidents manages to persuade the people in charge to change things, good job. You can go back to your life until the next protest. Over time, gathering into groups bound by ritual vows and taking collective action became the main way commoners fought against the authorities. It became common, almost like a formal complaint process. Authorities expected petitions to have certain phrases and talking points. There were examples of officials returning petitions because they didn't include an oath. From the documents that we have, it looks like commoners were not just dumb country people who only knew how to farm and beat their children. They were pretty smart, too. In one petition, some villagers demanded lower taxes because insects and high winds destroyed crops that year. The temple in charge of the land granted them a puny, insulting decrease in taxes. They would have laughed if they weren't so hungry. Instead of getting all pissy, the villagers showed some negotiation skills by poking at the pride of the temple officials. They sent another petition saying that the damage that year happened across the whole province, but of all the regions in the province, this one lowered its taxes the least. Shame cuts deeper than swords. The temple granted another tax cut, saying it was because of complaints from residents. Looks like labor does win sometimes. For more videos about asshole lords and samurai, check these out. We have a new emperor on Patreon today, Regan Leaf Valkyrie, Queen of the Norse. We also have some regular patrons, Oyster Sauce, a delicious sauce, Astix, Rectastic, Black Lily, Renee Anon, and Reed Lowry. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge.